Hello, and welcome back to another lecture video. My name is Carlos Brian Francia, and today we'll be doing a crash course on the digestive system. First, we'll do a general anatomy of the beginning of the alimentary canal and the ending of the alimentary canal. The alimentary canal begins at the mouth, and it's essentially this large tube that ends at the anus. So first we're gonna do a head to toe anatomy, and then afterwards we'll do a specific anatomy of the digestive system and the digestive process. Digestion first begins in the mouth. Now you may think, oh, we don't really digest food in the mouth, but you do, because the tongue releases two enzymes. The tongue releases two enzymes, and specifically those are gonna be salivary, salivary lipase, and salivary amylase. These are enzymes. ACE means enzyme. Lipase means that this enzyme is going to be breaking down the lipids or the fats. And the amylase just means that we're going to be breaking down carbohydrates. And so we can say that this is for fats and this one is for carbs or carbohydrates. One important thing to know is that the salivary lipase is not active in the mouth. So this one is not active in mouth. Instead, it needs a lower pH. And so this salivary lipase is gonna be active inside the stomach. It's gonna be active in stomach because the stomach has a lot of hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. In contrast, the salivary amylase is active in the mouth, so active in mouth and that kind of makes sense because if you were to take a cracker and just put it on your tongue over the next 10 seconds that cracker would kind of get softer and you would feel a little salt on your tongue and it would feel kind of squishy and that's the salivary amylase going to work it's breaking down those carbohydrates but where do we make that salivary amylase the salivary amylase is created by the salivary glands so we have these salivary salivary glands and specifically, there are the three main ones. There are the parotid gland, the submandibular salivary gland, and the sublingual salivary gland. And all that means is that, hey, we have a gland under the tongue, so linguistics is just tongue. Mandibular, that means jaw, so we can say that this salivary gland is under the jaw. And the parotid, it, it's kind of near your jaw, like your, uh, near your ear. So here's your ear, whatever, it's right next to it. And the salivary glands are going to be producing that amylase, and they release the amylase into the tongue via these ducts. So we have these tubes that push in the amylase into the tongue. One thing that you should know is that the parotid salivary gland produces the most, the most amylase. So the parotid gland produces the most amylase, and the saliva is a little bit more runny. It's a lot more thin. So there's more enzymes inside the saliva being produced by the parotid. The submandibular salivary gland, that produces eh, a little bit less amylase. But the saliva is a lot more thicker. So we could say thicker saliva. And we want a lot of saliva on the food so that when it goes into the throat, it has lubrication to go down the esophagus. You don't want to take in food that's dry because that's going to be very irritating to the throat. And so if you produce thicker saliva, well, you have a li little bit more lubrication for that food. And subsequently, the sublingual salivary gland, it produces the most, most saliva and the least amount of amylase. So really, its job is to lubricate the tongue. And there is a disease called Sjogren's syndrome in which there is no production of, of fluids in the body. So for instance, spit, saliva, uh, the fluid on the eye that keeps your eye hydrated, that's not produced. And so you have this generalized irritation of 
the fluid glands, for instance, the salivary gland or sweat glands, everything's not really functioning the way it should, and that's found in Sjogren's syndrome. Here we have Sjogren's syndrome, and we can see that this individual has a very swollen parotid gland. They would also have dry eyes because their eyes are not making that lubricating fluid and the mouth is not creating saliva and so swallowing food is very difficult because the throat is often dry it doesn't have that mucus being produced and there is almost no saliva being produced by the glands or by the tongue there is no cure for the Sjogren syndrome however people respond well to eye drops and steroids so for instance a tapered dose of prednisone, or you can give something called Plaquenil, which is hydroxychloroquine, to treat flare-ups. But there is no cure for Sjogren's syndrome. The reason why you would give Plaquenil or steroids for the individual is because really Sjogren's syndrome is when the immune system attacks. So the immune immune system attacks the glands that produce the fluid. So for instance, the immune system is attacking the parotid gland. That's why you see this irritation right here. And that's why you would give Plaquenil or steroids because those medications are gonna reset the immune system and hopefully the immune system stops attacking the glands. Of course, it's going to attack it again, but right now you're just making a calming effect for the patient. You're alleviating their symptoms right now. They will have flare-ups in which it happens again. So again, you can give something called Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. That's just a generic name. So you wanna treat it with steroids, but there is no cure for Sjogren's syndrome. When we eat food, we chew it up and we create something called a bolus. This is a bolus of food. And this bolus of food is gonna make its way from the mouth and it's covered in sal salivary amylase and salivary lipase. And now this bolus is gonna go down the pharynx. The pharynx is made up of three regions. We have the nasopharynx. This guy is just for breathing. Then we have the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. The oropharynx is just where the food goes into the throat. You could say this is kind of like the throat. But the laryngopharynx, that's kind of like the highway. You have two pathways right here. So this one is the oropharynx, and this one is gonna be the laryngeal. And if you go to the left portion, you're gonna enter the trachea, and that leads to the lungs. You don't want food or water entering the lungs. Instead, we want the food, or the bolus in this case, to enter the right portion of this highway. We want it to enter the esophagus. So this one is going to be the esophagus. Well, how do we dictate where to go? How do we prevent food and water entering the trachea? Inside of this region over here, this guy right there, that's called the glottis or the epiglottis. The epiglottis. And what that does is that the uvula, the little bell-shaped uh, piece of meat in your mouth, when it has food or water, it will flex, it will contract, and when it contracts, it sends the signal to the glottis to close. So this guy is going to close the, the trachea, and now the food only has one way to go. The food will only enter the esophagus. When we're breathing, the air goes into the nose, into the nasopharynx, and this glottis is opened because there's no food or water, and this air is just going to go into the trachea. So that's how the body controls where the food goes. We don't want it to go to the trachea, and so we make that glottis flex, and it closes the glottis, and now the food only goes to the esophagus. When we eat food, we swallow it, and we put it into the esophagus. The beginning of the esophagus is made from skeletal, skeletal muscle. And therefore, we can control this portion of the throat. We can take food, we can take a bite of a hamburger, and we can swallow it. We can control that. However, the further down you go to the esophagus, the more and more smooth muscle there is. And therefore, we can't control how the food goes down the, the esophagus. In fact, this is an autonomic process. So this is an autonomic, autonomic process. And that is being dictated by the medulla 
oblongata. The medulla oblongata is going to be sending out parasympathetic uh, signals. So it uses the parasympathetic signal to increase the amount of food that goes down the esophagus. So for instance, when we're learning about the stomach, uh, the medulla oblongata will send parasympathetic uh, signals to the stomach and the stomach begins churning, it begins working its magic on the food. So the whole digestive process is dictated by the parasympathetic nervous system. And specifically, when it relates to the digestive system, we call this the enteric, the enteric nervous system. But the master control unit is the medulla oblongata. And also, if you want to be a little smarty pants, little baby Einstein, you can say that the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, so we can say nerve 10, which is X, when it sends a signal to the stomach, the stomach will do its magic. And the less amount of signals you have from the vagus nerve, the less amount of digestion you have. So the vagus nerve and the medulla oblongata are both part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And therefore, more signals from the parasympathetic nervous system means more digestion. No more signals means no more di digestion. When the bolus, or the food, goes down the esophagus, the smooth muscles are now in action. So these guys are going to be inside the esophagus, the smooth muscles, and what they do is that they're going to push the food downwards, and you don't have to control it. The body controls the process itself. And this is called peri peristalsis. And you'll see this again in the intestines. But peristalsis is so strong that if I were to flip you upside down and you swallow some food, that food is still going to go into your stomach. It's not going to use gravity. It's going to use the smooth muscles. And that action of the food moving using the smooth muscles is peristalsis. So peristalsis is just smooth muscle contraction. So we have smooth muscle contractions. And we have this little exclamation mark. As the food goes downwards, it eventually reaches a blockade. And this blockade is called a sphincter. Now sphincters are found throughout the body. They're found in the anus, in the stomach, in the small intestines, and what they do is that they are checkpoints. The body controls how much food enters in one location, or how much of a substance enters the small intestines. If you didn't have these sphincters, then all the food in the stomach would just go into the small intestines all at once, and that would be very irritating to the intestines. If you didn't have a sphincter in your anus or in your rectum, you would defecate all over yourself, and that would be no fun. So sphincters are very important. And here in the bolus, in the esophagus, the bolus reaches the lower esophageal sphincter. Another name that we can call this is called the gastro, gastro esophageal, so phageal sphincter. Another name that you can call that is called the cardiac, cardiac sphincter. And the reason why we call this the cardiac sphincter is because the very entrance, the very beginning of the stomach is called the cardiac region. Cardiac region. So that's just the very top of the stomach. Here we have our first major character in digestion. We have the food entering from the esophagus, and then we have the gastroesophageal sphincter, also known as the cardiac sphincter. The very beginning of the stomach, this region right there, is called the cardia. The curving portion of the stomach is called the fundus, and then the rest of the curvature right here, that's called the body. So it's like this. This is the body of the stomach. When you taper off from the body, so we're focusing on this region, that region is called the pyloric antrum. If you taper off even more, we have the pyloric canal. And the pyloric canal will eventually have another sphincter right there, and that's just called the pyloric sphincter. And finally, the pyloric sphincter leads into the duodenum. The duodenum is part of the small intestine. 
you'll probably notice that there's a lot of muscle found within the stomach. The reason why the stomach needs all these muscles is because the stomach will fill up and contract, fill up and contract, and we can also squeeze the stomach to squeeze out food into the small intestine. And so all these muscles help for the churning, for the churning of the stomach. That's when the stomach squeezes and expands and it mixes all the food so it gets all the acid in the food and creates that mushy, uh, mushy substance. The whole purpose of the stomach is not to absorb nutrients, but rather it holds food. And it also puts in acid into the food. It uses hydrochloric acid to digest that food. And the whole process will make something called chyme. And chyme is like a watery substance. And that's where all the food has been mushed down. Because you can't fit a hamburger into the small intestine. That's not going to work. So we got to make that hamburger or taco into a liquid first. So the whole purpose of the stomach is to make that liquid, and that liquid is called chyme. And you're probably wondering, well, Brian, what's a serosa and what's a lumen? Well, to really explain that to you, I have to zoom in on the stomach and show you the parts of the mucosal lining. Here we have something called the mucosa. So the mucosa is found throughout the entire digestive system. You find it in the throat, the esophagus, you find it in the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestine, all the way down. But you will notice that in some regions of the body, this mucosa is modified. For instance, in the esophagus, you don't have the outer covering. You don't have something called the serosa. You have something that's different. You have something that is called the adventitia. Advent Adventitia. And that is just made from collagen. So in the esophagus, we don't have this outer layering. We, we just have something called adventitia, and that is made from very thick sheets of collagen. But for the most part, the mucosa remains the same throughout the digestive system. In the throat, in the stomach, in the small intestines and large intestines, we have something called the epithelium. So this food is going to be touching this inner region, and this is called the mucosa. So the mucosa has something called the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosae. Here is the epithelium, right there. When we eat something, the food enters the stomach and it sits on the stomach. It sits directly on the epithelium, and so the epithelium can release hydrochloric acid in the stomach. If we're talking about the large intestine, the epithelium has microvilli, and it can absorb the nutrients from the food. Right next to the epithelium, we have something called the lamina propria. And all this lamina propria, all that does is make sure that this epithelium stays in place. Now, sometimes you'll have a special, special feature of the lamina propria. In the small intestines, we'll call this SI, and in the large intestines, LI, we have something called the malt. We have something called malt. And what that is, is just mucosal, mucosal associated lymphatic or lymphoid, lymphoid tissue. And all that is, is that inside the lamina propria, there are special uh, immune cells right here. So when the food is being absorbed in the small intestine, sometimes there's bacteria. And we don't want any bacteria inside the body. We don't want any bacteria that can harm us. And so the lamina propria is going to release immune cells like T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, and that's going to kill the bacteria inside the food as it goes down the small intestine. So the lamina propria holds the epithelium, but it can also do an immune response. So this guy right here is awesome because he can do an immune response. But of course, you don't have that feature inside the stomach. You don't really have uh, malt. You don't have mucosal associated, associated lymphoid tissue inside the stomach. Instead, the lamina propria just holds the epithelium in place. You really see the malt tissue inside the large intestine and inside the small intestine. And these guys are gonna make uh, groups and these groups are called pyres. 
Pyre's patches. Patches. And all those are are just very big clusters of mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. And you find these guys inside the laminar papaya. Finally, we have something called the muscularis mucosae inside the mucosa. And this guy right here is always, always squeezing. But why are we always squeezing? Well, in the large intestines and the small intestines, we want the muscularis mucosae to be squeezing because if we have this, like that, and we have the food uh, passing through the large intestine and small intestine, we want them to spend more time inside the intestines. So here we're making contact with the upper portion and the lower portion of the small intestine and the large intestine. However, if we didn't have this muscularis mucosae squeezing, we would just have a simple tube, and here we have the food, or the chyme, just flowing past normally. It goes quickly inside the small intestine, and it's not really spending enough time. You want to have enough time to digest the food. And so this muscularis mucosae will create bunches inside the intestine. And that allows the chyme or the food to pass slowly. And it spends more time digesting. So now we have more nutrients entering the intestinal tissues. So without this muscularis mucosae, we would have uh, relaxed intestines. And that's not good. Moving on from the mucosa, we have something called the muscularis. And the muscular is very muscular. So here you have the circular muscles, like this, the circular muscles, and then you also have the longitudinal muscles, which go like this. So together, the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle will contract. And these guys help in peri peristalsis. So the large intestine and the small intestine will use peristalsis to move the, the food or the chyme throughout the intestinal tract. In the stomach, you will notice that we have the longitudinal muscle, we have the circular muscle, but we have another muscle, and that's very special for the stomach, and this is called the oblique layer. This is the oblique, oblique layer. And this oblique layer is instead going like this, it's going upwards. And what that does is that it allows the stomach to contract efficiently. It allows it to churn the food. And so the stomach has an extra layer of muscle inside the muscularis, and that's called the oblique layer. You don't see the oblique layer inside the large intestine or the small intestine. You only see it inside the stomach. And you're probably wondering, well, how does the body tell the organs to contract and to relax? What are the nerves called? Well, that is called the myenteric, it's called the myenteric plexus. Plexus just means collection. And so we have a collection of nerves, and we call that collection of nerves the myenteric plexus. An easy way to remember this is that most of the time, anything with my, myen, or M-Y-E, is going to be muscle-related. So this is muscle. For instance, myofibroblasts, or myocardia. Myo means muscle, so we have myo equal muscle. So the myenteric plexus is just the collection of nerves that tell the smooth muscles to contract and to relax. If you want to be a smarty pants, you can say that this is the plexus, plexus of Eierbach. So that's an A. So plexus of Eierbach is another name to call the myenteric plexus. Between the mucosa and the muscularis is something called the submucosa. And the submucosa has blood vessels and nerves. But what makes the submucosa really special is that it has these glands. So it has glands. And these glands are going to release enzymes. And depending on where we are at in the digestive system, the enzymes do something different. For instance, you might have the enzyme releasing amylase to digest carbohydrates in the small intestines, or you might be releasing enzymes inside the stomach that digest proteins. So really these enzymes differ depending on the location of the organ. And the way the body tells the submucosa to release the enzymes is through the usage of the sub 
mucosal plexus, and this is also known as the plexus of Meissner. So all that does is that it says, hey, we have some food inside the intestine. I'm going to send a signal from the submucosal plexus, also known as the plexus of Meissner, and we're going to tell the submucosa to start releasing those digestive enzymes. So now these little enzymes inside the submucosa are going to leak into the epithelium, and then the enzymes are going to kind of go into the chyme and do their little action. So we have the submucosal glands taking in that enzyme and they shoot it out. And where they shoot it out is within the epithelium of the mucosa. So you will see that in action in a few minutes. But essentially the submucosa senses that we have food uh, in the stomach or in the small intestine, and it uses the submucosal plexus to send signals. And the signals will dictate when to release the enzymes and what kind of enzymes we release. And we release those enzymes through the epithelium of the mucosa. Finally, on the outer layer, we have something called the serosa, and the serosa is what you see in the stomach or in the large intestine or small intestine. So for instance, here you have the serosa, and that is just this tan outer lining of the stomach. And we just use the serosa to protect the organs from other organs because when the stomach expands and contracts, expands and contracts, it is rubbing inside the body. And so the serosa protects the stomach from irritation from other um, organs. You will also notice something called the mesentery. The mesentery is just kind of like a thin film that covers the organs and it keeps the organs in place. So for instance, there is a mesentery covering the stomach and it holds the stomach in place. There's a mesentery covering the gallbladder, mesentery covering the liver. It's basically like a plastic bag that makes that makes sure that all the organs stay in place and they don't touch each other or they don't rub on each other. When the stomach churns and it starts digesting the food, we now form something called chyme. And this chyme is going to build up and eventually it starts building up at the pyloric canal and eventually it will be pushed into the duodenum. And the duodenum, as you recall, is the beginning of the small intestine. In order for this chyme to pass through the pyloric sphincter, we have to use a reflex. And the reflex that we use is called the enterogastric reflex. So this is the entero, enterogastric gastric reflex. And that just allows this sphincter to relax and allows the chyme to enter the duodenum. After the chyme has entered the duodenum, the pyloric sphincter closes. We only allow about three milliliters of chyme at a single moment to enter the duodenum. Because if we had too much chyme in the duodenum, the chyme is very acidic and it's going to kind of burn this mucosal lining. Because here we have a lot of hydrochloric acid and therefore this chyme has a very low pH from that acid. So we have to limit how much chyme enters the duodenum. And in this case, we only allow about three milliliters of chyme into the duodenum. We are now entering the small intestine. So here we had this stomach, and the stomach touches the duodenum from the pyloric sphincter. It uses the enterogastric reflex to push the chyme into the duodenum. In this portion, this is the superior, superior portion of the duodenum. This portion right here is the in, uh, descending, descending portion of the duodenum. This portion is the horizontal portion. And this guy right here is the ascending, ascending duodenum. And all that happens here in this duodenum is that we're going to be using enzymes to kind of regulate how acidic this chyme is. We're also going to be communicating with the pancreas, the pancreas, and also the liver, because we need the liver to use bile. And we're going to talk about these guys later, but what I'm saying here is that the duodenum is super important because here we're going to put enzymes in the food. We're going to control the pH of the chyme. We're going to start absorbing the nutrients of the chyme. We will speak with the pancreas and the pancreas is going to secrete even more enzymes. We use the bile produced by the liver to start absorbing the lipids from the chyme. The duodenum is super important and it's kind of like the workhorse of the small intestine. Everything begins in the duodenum. 
going past the duotinum, we enter the jejunum. So the food passes right here, the stachyme, and eventually it enters another region of the small intestine, and this is called the ileum. You will notice that the ileum is the largest. This is the largest portion. And this is where most of the absorption happens. So all the nutrients are being absorbed in the ileum. The duodenum just sets up the chyme with enzymes. And it will travel throughout the jejunum, eventually entering the ileum. And the ileum will absorb all the nutrients from that food. So this is a very important region of the small intestine. And we only call it a small intestine, even though it's long, because the diameter of the intestines are very small. It's about an inch in diameter. The large intestine in comparison is three inches in diameter. So it gives you a perspective of why we call it the small intestine in the first place. Now let's zoom in on the small intestine and see the microvilli and the villi that helps absorb the food and the nutrients. If we zoom in on the small intestine, we will notice that we have these little bumps right there. And these bumps are called circular folds. Here is a circular, circular fold. And what this does is that when we have the chyme flowing throughout the small intestine, the chyme will kind of make its way into the circular folds and spends more time in the small intestine. And when this happens, we are absorbing the nutrients. So these small circular folds increase the amount of time that the chyme spends in the small intestine. When we increase the amount of time, we increase the amount of nutrient absorption. Inside the circular folds, we have these bumps, and these bumps are called villi. And we have a picture of the villi right there. If we zoom in even more on the, on the uh, circular folds, we will notice that we have these villi. And the villi do the same thing as the circular folds. The chyme spends more time touching the villi. And that increases the amount of absorption of nutrients. But you have to realize that the villi also have villi of their own. And these villi are so small that we call them microvilli. So if we take this section and we zoom in, we will notice that there's more villi. So let's do that right now. Finally, we have the microvilli. And the microvilli, again, they increase the amount of time that the food spends touching the small intestine. And when we have this occurring, we have more nutrient absorption. So again, the small intestine has a lot of folds. It has the circular fold, and each circular fold has the villi. And each villi have million and million and million uh, amount of microvilli. And these microvilli will form a border, and this border is called the brush border. The brush border will release enzymes. So as the chyme goes down the small intestine, the small intestine is releasing enzymes, and these enzymes help break down carbohydrates, they break down proteins, they break down all the nutrients, and it's able to absorb those nutrients into the body. Each villi will have a capillary. So we have the oxygenated capillary, that's red, and we also have the deoxygenated capillary, and that's blue. When we have digestion, we break down the carbs. We also break down proteins. What do we break them down to? We break this down into glucose, for the most part, and we break down proteins into amino acids. So now we have amino acids, we also have glucose just floating around, and these guys are going to enter the villi. As the oxygen leaves the oxygenated blood, the deoxygenated blood will take the glucose and the amino acids and it will take them into the liver. So this guy is going to go into the liver and the liver is going to filter out any bad things from the nutrients and then it's going to send the nutrients into the heart and the heart is going to disperse the nutrients into the body. However, you will notice that I didn't mention lipids. Lipids cannot enter the blood. You know that lipid is a hydrophobic and blood has a lot of water in it. So you don't want any free floating lipids in the blood. 
Instead, the lipid is going to enter the lacteal. So we have the lipids entering the lacteal. And the lacteal is going to go into the liver as well. The lacteal is part of the lymphatic, lymphatic system. And the lacteal is going to be using bile. It uses bile produced by the liver to transfer the lipids into the liver. So bile is going to be carrying lipids into the lacteal. In the middle of the villi, we have something called an intestinal crypt. And this is called the crypt of Lieberkuhn. And what the crypt of Lieberkuhn does is that it is going to excrete enzymes. So we have enzymes being made. And these enzymes, uh, for instance, we have fructase and maltase just as an example, and these guys are going to break down the carbohydrates and release, release fructose and maltose, but they're all created by these intestinal crypts. Specifically, if you want to be a smarty pants, you can say that they are filled with entero, enterocytes. And enterocytes are just the absorptive, absorptive cells. These guys and we'll talk about them later, these guys help absorb nutrients from the chyme. And all these uh, enzymes are being secreted by the crypt of Lebacune, also known as enterocytes. In this portion, we have the ileum of the small intestine, and then we also have this region right there, and this is the large intestine. Specifically, this is the cecum. This is the cecum. Between the cecum and the ileum, we have another sphincter. We have a sphincter. And the sphincter is going to be called the ilio, iliocecal sphincter. So we have all this digested chyme in the small intestine. And now we have to pass this chyme into the large intestine. And what is blocking us is the iliocecal sphincter. So we have to use another reflex, and this is called the gastroileal reflex. So we have the gastro, gastroileal, ileal reflex. And all that does is that it will increase the contractions within the ileal of the small intestine. It will squeeze that chyme into the cecum and it closes the ileocecal sphincter. So all that happens is that we gotta get this chyme from the small intestine into the cecum, and the way we do this is that we use the gastroileal reflex. And what that does is that it will contract the small intestine and push that chyme past the ileocecal sphincter. Afterwards, when the chyme is here, the ileocecal sphincter closes, and now that chyme can travel inside the large intestine. In this region where we have the ileum meeting the large intestine, we have a large concentration of these pyres patches. These pyres, pyres patches. And they kind of look like little lumps right here. And they are filled with a lot of lymphoid cells. So for instance, natural killer cells or B cells or T cells. And they are a part of the mucosal, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. And you might see some people call this the malt. This is the malt. Now, all the malt does is that it monitors the type of bacteria inside the chyme. When you eat food, you always have the possibility of ingesting bad bacteria. In the, in the gut, in the intestines, we have a community of good bacteria. And mainly, you see these good bacteria inside the large intestine. And these good bacteria digest the chyme even further. They digest the carbohydrates, they make vitamin K, they make biotin, and they're really good bacteria. However, when you eat food, you always have the possibility of ingesting bad bacteria, and we don't want any bad guys infiltrating the large intestine. 
And so the Peyer's patches, part of the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, is going to monitor the type of bacteria inside this region, inside the region where the large intestine meets the small intestine. And if there's a bad bacteria, the lymphoid tissue will release an immune response. And the immune response is not going to kill the good bacteria, but instead is going to release immune cells that selectively kill the bad bacteria. And so this is actually a selective, this is a selective immune response. Or you can say it is specific. And so that's always on exams. It says, is it non-specific or is it specific? It is a specific immune response. Here's how the malt works. Inside the distal ileum, that means the furthest part of the ileum where we almost enter the large intestine, we use the malt. And inside the malt, we have something called dendritic cells. This is a dendritic cell. And what this guy does is that he's gonna have a lot of arms. And these arms are dendrites. And what they do is that they fill around for bacteria. And these are the bacteria. So in the gut, we have good bacteria. That's the good guy. And we also have bad guys. These guys are always angry for some reason. They're probably studying anatomy. But these guys are gonna be wearing hats. And these hats that you see here in this little triangle, they are called antigens. So these guys are antigens the little hats that they wear. And the dendrites are gonna be feeling for these antigens. And when it senses that this guy doesn't have a triangle hat, it will say, uh-uh, we don't want you here. We're gonna take this hat and we're gonna present it to the T cell. And now the T cell realizes that, hey, we do not want this little square antigen. So every bacteria that carries this square antigen is going to be eliminated. So now we have the T cells eliminating the bad bacteria. So now this bad angry bacteria is going to be excreted from the body. The immune response will be specific towards the bacteria with this square antigen. However, sometimes there is a malfunction. In some individuals, the T cell is going to be angry at the triangle antigens. And these triangle antigens, they are going to be called sussy. Sus C antigens. And that's actually a real antigen inside the uh, small intestine. And the good bacteria have the sus C antigens. And really, they're not triangle shaped. I just put a shape randomly. But the good bacteria carry this sus C antigen. And sometimes the T cells will target the good bacteria, even though. In most individuals, the sus C antigen is a good antigen, and we don't want to attack it. But in people with Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease, this is this is exactly what is happening. So a lot of people have a theory, a lot of scientists have a theory that the T cells will mistakenly attack bacteria with the sus C antigen. And when this happens, we have inflammation. Now we have inflammation. And this inflammation is going to cause abdominal pain. It causes diarrhea. It causes people to have sharp pains. And that is called Crohn's disease. And typically, you will have flare-ups. So you have flare-ups. Flare-ups. And there is no cure for Crohn's disease. However, you can kind of reset, you can reset the immune response by giving steroids. One of the most classic types of steroids we can give is prednisone. That's kind of like the poster child, prednisone. However, you don't want to have a person on prednisone for too long because then the person becomes immunocompromised and they have a weakened re uh, immune response. And so we want to do like a short course, maybe seven days or 10 days of just using a low dose of prednisone, so maybe five milligrams. And we do that for a short course for that individual. 
And again, a lot of people don't know why Crohn's disease occurs in the first place, but there is a theory in which the T cells will attack good bacteria that express the sus C antigens. And now you have this immune response attacking the good bacteria and that causes inflammation and abdominal pain, diarrhea, etc. And so typically you want to give a steroid for a short course. And that doesn't prevent Crohn's disease from occurring again. It just alleviates the pain. We are now entering the large intestine. Here we have kind of like the border between the ileum and the cecum. Between this guy, the purple border, is the ileocecal sphincter. And we use the gastroileal reflex to push the chyme from the ileum into the cecum. Here on the intestine is the cecum and you'll also notice the appendix. So a lot of people will say, oh, the appendix doesn't do anything. We don't really need it. We can just cut it out. That's true if it becomes swollen and inflamed, but the appendix does do something special. The bacteria that lives in the gut, the good bacteria, they always party inside the appendix. So they always live inside the appendix. When you use antibiotics, it kills all the bacteria inside the gut, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. But sometimes the good bacteria hide inside the appendix. And when everything is calmed down, the good bacteria go back into the gut. So they move from the appendix and they repopulate the gut. And so this guy right here is a good um, safe haven for the good bacteria. It also has a lot of lymphatic tissue. So if we have bad bacteria, the T cells will come out and they start kind of killing all the bad bacteria that is in the gut. But sometimes the appendix does uh, get inflamed and it could actually burst. And when it bursts, it will allow the bacteria to enter the outside of the body. So like you know, the organs that are outside of the GI system will become infected with all the bacteria from the GI system. So if we have a burst appendix, you can actually die. You can actually become septic. You can become septic. And that's when we have a generalized infection inside the body. And that can be very fatal. So if, if we do become inflamed or infected, we have a appendectomy in which we remove the appendix. So a lot of people will say, oh, we don't need the appendix. We actually do. But if it becomes inflamed, we can just do a simple surgery and remove that appendix. The chyme first enters in the cecum, and then it has to be pushed via contractions up the colon. So we call this the ascending colon. The chyme will then make a right turn at the right colic flexure. We call this hepatic because it's right under the liver. So here we have the liver, and I'm not a good artist, so I'm just gonna draw a square, but this guy is the liver, and it's right above the right colic flexure. Over here we have the spleen, let's make a circle, and that spleen is gonna sit right on top of the left colic flexure. So if you're ever doing surgery, and the surgeon says, hey, I want you to look at the hepatic flexure, you want to look at this region because there might be something going on here. It might be a tear and you're gonna to have to repair that tear. Or if he says, or if she says, there is a um, splenic flexure fissure or a tear, you gotta look at this region. So that's kind of like the application of it. You also have the descending colon where the chyme goes down. And then we have this S shape. And this S shape is, is called sigmoid colon. Sigmoid has an S. So the chyme goes all the way over here, and eventually it enters the rectum, and the rectum is going to lead into the anal canal. So first, before we talked about this region, we're gonna talk about the transverse colon, or the colon in general, the anatomy of it. Throughout the large intestine, we have what looks like bumps right here. So we have this little package right there, and these guys are called hostra. And hostra are made by the tinea coli. Tinea, that's just Latin for ribbon. So we have these little strips of smooth muscle that will contract and they will create that shape for the colon. They are called hostra. Specifically, we have three smooth muscles that do this. They are the free, the omental, and also the mesocolic, the meso, mesocolic, tinea coli. So these guys will create that little curvature for that colon. 
However, sometimes you can have too much pressure inside the colon. For instance, in the sigmoid colon, in the sigmoid, sigmoid colon, we have a buildup of pressure. And when this happens, the pressure will start making these little bumps inside the hostra. So we're going to start making some bumps right there. And that's when the area becomes weak and we form these little balloons inside the hostra. And this is called diverticula. So these are diverticula. When you grow older, the smooth muscles don't contract as powerfully. And so sometimes you have these little balloon shapes forming on the hostra where the pressure is building up. And these little diverticula can rupture and allow bacteria into the intestines. And that causes inflammation. When that happens, you have diverticulitis. The formation of the diverticula is called diverticulosis. As you can see, this is the large intestine, or the colon. This guy right here is diverticula. So we have diverticulosis occurring. Normally, it would be a smooth surface that has these nice uniform camel hump looking structures. But notice that we have this roundness right there. That shouldn't be there. You can also see it right here. And if you eat something sharp, let's say almonds or popcorn, the kernels inside the popcorn are very sharp and they're going to cause some cuts right here. They're going to cut these little diverticula. And when they cut the diverticula, you have bleeding. So you might have a patient that says, hey, I was passing out some uh, dark stool. I also have abdominal pain and I just had some food. I just had some popcorn or some seeds or whatever. Well, they have diverticulitis. And when you have diverticulitis, a medication that you can prescribe is called Flagyl. Flagyl. And it's 500 milligrams three times a day, so TID, for 10 days. And the generic for Flagyl is called Metronidazole. So we have Metro ni dazole and this is an antibiotic the reason why we give an antibiotic is because when you have diverticulitis you have inflammation you have irritation you have bacteria entering the cuts inside the diverticula and it's going to cause an infection so flagell is given to kill this bad bacteria that is infiltrating the diverticula so flagell is given to kill those bacteria Typically, you see diverticulitis within the elderly, and that's because the hostra have increased pressure, and the smooth muscle is not as uh, contracted. It's kind of loose, so we have these pockets of diverticula forming for the elderly. We also have it when the people who have diverticula eat sharp foods. So we have sharp foods. You may be eating almonds nuts, seeds, or popcorn. The popcorn has a little kernel, and sometimes those little kernels get stuck in your, in your teeth, but it looks like a thin film, and those kernels can really slice through the diverticula and cause an infection. So these are the foods to avoid, and typically you see diverticulitis in the elderly. If we take a cross-section of the large intestine, specifically the transverse colon, so this is the transverse, transverse colon, we would notice that we don't have a lot going on. We have some microvilli, but the microvilli, they don't secrete any enzymes. The microvilli, instead, they're going to be used to absorb water. The microvilli will also secrete mucus, and the mucus is secreted by goblet cells. So the goblet, goblet cells, they just secrete mucus, and the, mucus, the mucus is going to be acting as lubricant. And that is lubricant for the forming stool. So as chyme goes down the large intestine, it loses water. So all this water exits because it's being absorbed. So all this water exits the chyme. And when this happens, the chyme stops being so watery and it starts forming a solid. So now we have the solid that is forming right there. 
but we don't want this solid to be traveling inside the large intestine without any lubrication. And so the mucus cells or the goblet cells are gonna start secreting some lubricant. And that just helps the stool pass through the large intestine. Inside the large intestine, we have good bacteria. So we have something like this. We have bacteria. And this bacteria is good and is going to perform sacrolytic fermentation. And what this means is that as the chyme goes down the large intestine and is losing water, there's still some carbohydrates in there. However, the carbohydrates were not broken down by the enzymes in the small intestine. So instead, the bacteria is going to go to the chyme and it's going to start breaking down the chyme even further. And it releases vitamin K. It releases uh, all these digestive things, so carbs, uh, biotin, whatever. But sacrolytic fermentation is going to release the last bit of carbs before we create that stool and we excrete that stool. So the bacteria inside the large intestines will perform sacrolytic fermentation and release carbohydrates. And these carbs are going to be absorbed and uh, used as nutrients. Here we have the rectum and the anus. So the upper portion is called the rectum, and the lower portion is called the anus. And one thing that you should know is that the muscularis is very strong. And that allows the person to have contractions and to defecate. So when the stool forms here, the contractions are very strong, and eventually it leaves the body. So the muscularis is very strong. There is no hostra and there is no tinea coli. Instead, we just have a more developed muscularis. Here, we have the rectum and the anus. So the upper portion is called the rectum, and the lower portion is called the anus. And one thing that you should know is that the muscularis is very strong. And that allows the person to have contractions and to defecate. So when the stool forms here, the contractions are very strong and eventually it leaves the body. So the muscularis is very strong. There is no hostra and there is no tinea coli. Instead, we just have a more developed muscularis. Here we have the rectum and the anus. So the upper portion is called the rectum and the lower portion is called the anus. And one thing that you should know is that the muscularis is very strong. And that allows the person to have contractions and to defecate. So when the stool forms here, the contractions are very strong and eventually it leaves the body. So the muscularis is very strong. There is no hostra and there is no tinea coli. Instead, we just have a more developed muscularis. Now that we've finished talking about the intestines and the esophagus, we have to talk about the liver and the pancreas because these guys are very closely related to the duodenum. And now we're going to be talking about their anatomy, and then finally we're going to go into the chemical digestive process. The pancreas is very closely related to the duodenum. In fact, the juices that we create in the pancreas are going to be put into the duodenum from this little valve right here. And this valve is called the hepatopancreatic ampulla, the hepato, hepatopancreatic ampulla. So the liver right here, we're going to have this liver, is going to send bile inside this bile collecting duct. and is going to meet up with the pancreas and it's going to uh, secrete bile and also pancreatic juices. Pancreatic juices are created inside the pancreas, specifically by these acinar cells, acinar cells. And these acinar cells are exocrines, exocrines. So they secrete enzymes that go into the duodenum and the duodenum will take the bile and the pancreatic juices and put them into the small intestine. Likewise, the pancreas also has 
endocrine cells. We have endocrines. Specifically, we have the alpha endocrines, we have the beta cells, we have the delta cells as well. And we also have the polypeptide cells. So the alpha cells are going to release glucagon. The beta cells release insulin. The delta cells release somato, somatostatin. And the polypeptide cells is kind of like a, uh, it, they're just enzymes that aid in digestion. So they break down the peptides. You release glucagon when we have low blood sugar and you gotta increase the amount of carbs in the body and the amount of glucose in the body. Insulin is released when the body has too much carbohydrates in the blood and we gotta put those carbohydrates inside the cells. Somatostatin is released when we want to stop digestion. So that is kinda like pressing the brakes on the car. When we are digesting, we gotta stop eventually and so the pancreas releases somatostatin by the uh, delta cells. In this case, we're going to be focusing more on the exocrines. We're going to be focusing on the exocrines. And the exocrines will create the pancreatic juices. Pancreatic juices. And these guys have a high pH. So this is alkaline. Why are we making something that's alkaline? Well, if you recall, we have the chyme entering here. And this chyme has a low pH because it has a bunch of hydrochloric acid. And if we have all this hydrochloric acid in the chyme, it's going to be irritating to the mucosal lining of the small intestine. And that's how you form ulcers, if there's too much of a low pH. And so the pancreatic juices is going to be shot out from the hepatic pancreatic uh, ampulla, and it's going to increase the pH. It's gonna make it a little bit more basic, so it's not gonna irritate the lining of the uh, small intestine. In addition to this, the pancreatic juices also has enzymes. So we also have enzymes. So the enzymes are going to be placed into the chyme, and it's going to digest the carbohydrates, the peptides. It's going to start breaking down the lipids, and that is being created by this pancreas. Now, something that you have to remember is that inside this area, inside this hepatopancreatic ampulla, is a sphincter. So we have something called a sphincter. And the sphincter is very important because it is called the sphincter of Odi. So here we have the combination of bile and the pancreatic juices. We have this door called the hepatopancreatic ampulla, but we have to open that door. And that is called the sphincter of Odi. So it controls how much bile enters the duodenum. It controls how much pancreatic juices enter the duodenum. And depending on what kind of enzymes we need, the enzymes will open this door, and this door will allow the flow of pancreatic juices. Here we have the gallbladder and the liver. So the liver actually produces the bile. So we have the bile being created inside the liver, and eventually the bile has to enter this duct. So really, it's not pictured here, but we have so many uh, branches inside the liver, and you can kind of see it forming like a tree. And eventually all these ducts meet into this region. So this is actually called the biliary, biliary uh, branch. And sometimes you can have an obstruction inside the biliary branch, and that can lead to inflammation, and you have to kind of do a lot of scans, and you have to see a gastroenterologist, because for some reason there's a blockage here. And if you have a buildup of bile inside the liver, uh, that's bad news. So these guys are going to enter this region. This, call, this is called the right hepatic duct, and this guy right here is called the left hepatic duct. And these guys will merge into this region, and this is just called the common hepatic duct because it joins the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. Here we have the gallbladder, and the anatomy of the gallbladder is very similar to the anatomy of the stomach, in which the curvature right here is called the fundus, and this large portion of the gallbladder is called the body. 
and then we have the neck of the gallbladder. And the whole purpose of the gallbladder is to store the bile. So when we are not digesting food, we are still creating bile in the liver. And so the bile will be sent to the gallbladder. So we store, we store bile, and we also concentrate bile. Mm -hmm. One important thing to know about the gallbladder is that there is no submucosa. So we have no submucosa. Instead, we just have a lining of mucosa. And this mucosa is going to gather water, it's going to gather electrolytes and bile salts, and it's going to concentrate the bile. So the bile is very powerful inside the gallbladder. When it receives a signal from the duodenum, it's going to release this bile. And what it does is that the bile is going to leave the gallbladder, it's going to enter the cryptic duct, or the cystic duct right there, and the cystic duct is going to meet inside the common hepatic duct. And when these guys meet, they leave via the common bile duct. So you can say that the common hepatic duct only incorporates the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. The common bile duct is the combination of the right hepatic duct, the left hepatic duct, and also the cystic, cystic duct. And so again, eventually you have the common bile duct joining into the duodenum. Here we also have the combination of the common bile duct and the pancreatic uh, duct. So they combine into the hepatic pancreatic ampulla or the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And the sphincter of Odi, which is right here, will open and close and it will dictate how much uh, pancreatic juice and bile enter the duodenum. And we want this because the pancreatic juices and the bile will help facilitate the digestion of the chyme. Now that we've covered the anatomy of the digestive system, we now will cover the chemical digestive process of the body. And so now we're going to go back into the stomach and go over the digestive process. Here we have the stomach. You may have noticed the chart to the left. Don't worry about it. Right now, all we're focusing on is this first two sections. This third section, we'll talk about it when we enter the small intestine, but right now we're going to be talking about the stomach, and so we're going to focus on the cephalic phase and the gastric phase. All these phases occur when you're digesting something. For instance, when I think about food, maybe a burrito or a taco, I'm thinking about it. I'm doing the cephalic phase. The cephalic phase, that just means head. That means the brain. So the sight or thought of the food, it goes into the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is just kind of like the, the outer layer of the brain, all the wrinkles of the brain. And the cerebral cortex is going to send a signal to the hypothalamus and to the medulla oblongata. The hypothalamus does everything. All the inputs go there except for smell. So all the senses and all your ideas, they go into the hypothalamus except for smell. So the hypothalamus and the medulla oblongata are going to send parasympathetic signals via the vagus nerve. Again, the vagus nerve is the main person who is parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. And again, this is cranial nerve number 10. So that is X. And likewise, I can decrease my appetite. So I could get scared or I can think about something sad like my loans that I just took out and I don't want to eat anything after that. I'm sick to my stomach. And so the cerebral cortex is going to have those really sad thoughts or you're scared or something and it's going to decrease the amount of parasympathetic uh, nerve signals that we're sending. It will actually increase the sympathetic center. So sympathetic means that we're going to not eat anything. We're not going to digest anything. So again, if we're looking at the activation of the gastric system, we're going to be sending more parasympathetic nerve signals. And when you send those signals to the stomach, this is what happens. That brings us to the gastric phase. And the gastric phase is all about the stomach. So when we have food right here, the food enters and it hides in the fundus. The fundus is more like the, the waiting room for the stomach. Let's say that this is a hamburger and half of the hamburger goes into the lower portion of the stomach and it goes and it churns and it churns and it becomes chyme. 
the other half of the hamburger has to wait in the fundus. And eventually, part of this hamburger will go back into the lower stomach and churn. When we fill the stomach up with food, it expands. And when we expand, we stretch. And when we stretch, we send signals to the medulla oblongata. And the medulla oblongata sends more signals to the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve will send parasympathetic signals and it will stimulate the activity of the stomach. Likewise, when the stomach senses food, like carbohydrates or proteins, it will start secreting more acid. It will start secreting more enzymes. What kind of enzymes do we secrete? And what kind of cells are inside the stomach? Here we have the mucosal layer of the stomach. The mucosal layer is going to have the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis. Now notice that the muscularis has something special. The muscularis is going to have the oblique layer, and this layer allows us to churn in the stomach. But if we look in the epithelium, you will notice that we have these weird looking shapes, and these weird looking shapes are called gastric pits. If we zoom in on a gastric pit, this is what we see. We see different cells in here. We have the parietal cell, we have the chief cells, and then we have the enteroendocrine cells. The parietal cells are pretty important because they are going to release hydrochloric acid. This is the main digestive acid that the stomach secretes. We will also release something called intrinsic, intrinsic factor, and this is super important because intrinsic factor allows the small intestine to absorb vitamin B12. So this one is vitamin, vitamin B12. Without vitamin B12, the body would not be able to create red blood cells. We would not be able to create proteins. We would not be able to survive. The body does not make its own B12. We get it from our diet. And so the body will create intrinsic factor that allows us to absorb vitamin B12. If we did not int have intrinsic factor, we would die because we would not be able to create DNA or proteins or create red blood cells. Going back into the hydrochloric acid, we use hydrochloric acid not only to digest food, but we activate an enzyme. Here, these chief cells, these chief cells right here, they release something called pepsinogen, pepsinogen. So that is pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is going to create something. And that is going to be what? Pepsin. So gen means to generate. What are we generating? We are generating pepsin. And pepsin is going to digest protein. So we digest protein. If pepsin was always active in the stomach, the stomach would literally digest itself. And so we have to regulate how much pepsin is active in the stomach. If you are not eating anything, we don't want pepsin to be active. And so hydrochloric acid will increase in the stomach when we are digesting something, and therefore it will convert pepsinogen into pepsin and help us digest a protein in the food. And finally, we have enteroendocrine cells, and what they produce is something called a gastrin hormone. So these guys right here, these guys are going to produce something called gastrin. So gastrin is going to increase motility, or the contractions of the stomach. They increase the hydrochloric acid production, and it increases gastric emptying. So the ability for the stomach to push the chyme into the pyloric sphincter, that is called gastric emptying. And that is caused by gastrin. This guy right here is the main digestive hormone. And speaking of hormones, we have to talk about ghrelin. So ghrelin, ghrelin is secreted by the stomach and that tells the body that, hey, we're hungry. So ghrelin is secreted by the body and it tells itself that we have not eaten and we need to eat something. So ghrelin makes us hungry. And now you're probably wondering, well, how does the stomach not burn itself? Well, right here on the surface of the stomach, we have a very thick layer of uh, bicarbonate mucus. So we have a bicarbonate right there 
and this guy right here is going to interact with the acid and it is going to act as a base. So this one right here is going to control the pH of the stomach. And they're invisible in this image, but here we have little stem cells. And these stem cells are gonna rejuvenate the lining of the stomach. So the lining of the stomach only persists for about a week. So the complete lining of the stomach is going to be recycled and renewed so that we will always have a new fresh lining, a new fresh mucosal layer for the stomach. And now we only have three more hormones to discuss in the stomach. The first one is called histamine. Histamine. And you're probably saying, hey, histamine, that's what happens when we have an allergic reaction. Well, sure, but it's also a hormone. And this histamine is going to do what? It's going to increase the amount of hydrochloric acid that the stomach produces. And a nice way to remember this is that histamine sounds like a hissing sound. And when you touch acid, your finger hisses. So we can say histamine increases the amount of hydrochloric acid that the stomach produces. We also produce something called serotonin. Serotonin. And serotonin is going to increase the stomach contractions. So this is stomach contractions. An easy way to remember this is that when you're happy, you have a lot of serotonin. And when you're happy, you're often dancing around your room, you're listening to music, you're jumping around. Likewise, in the stomach, when we have serotonin, the stomach is going to be jumping around and dancing and it's going to be moving. It's going to have more contractions, more movement. It's going to move that food and it's going to churn. And we use serotonin to increase that churning ability. But eventually, all good things come to an end. And so the stomach will eventually produce something called somatostatin. And statin usually means to decrease. Somato means human, so decrease human activity. Somatostatin is going to be produced by the stomach when we need to stop digesting. So this decreases digestion. It decreases motility. It decreases the production of hydrochloric acid. It decreases the production of pancreatic juices. It basically stops digesting. And then the body can digest the food inside the intestines and the stomach will stop secreting that acid. So somatostatin in the stomach decreases the production of hydrochloric acid, the motility, and it just calms everything down. It gives the body a chance to kind of digest the food that it already has and to relax. When we decrease the amount of somatostatin, the body will produce more gastrin. And now the stomach will start to digest again. So gastrin is the acceleration pedal and somatostatin is the brake. Before we move on, we have to discuss the way that the body decreases digestion. So in the gastric phase, if we have too low of a pH, so for instance, we have too much acid, then the body is not going to like that because too low of a pH is going to start burning holes in the stomach. And those are called ulcers. And we don't want that. So if we detect a low pH using the chemoreceptors, we're going to start to decrease the gastrin production. So gastrin just increases the digestive process. And so if we decrease the gastrin production, we decrease the digestive process. Also, if a chihuahua is biting on my ear, I'm scared, you know, I'm terrified. And so emotional distress is going to activate the sympathetic nervous system, and that's going to decrease the parasympathetic nervous system, and therefore is going to decrease the gastric uh, process. Let's talk about the enzymes that is found inside the food. So here we have the food and it enters the stomach but this food just came from the mouth, and the mouth has those salivary glands. And the salivary glands, of course, they produce salivary amylase. We also produce salivary lipase. Amylase is activated in the mouth, and it is deactivated with the hydrochloric acid. And so the amylase is going to be deactivated in the stomach, but the lipase is going to be activated by the hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid is going to activate lipase. And now we have these enzymes that start breaking down the fats inside the stomach. 
and subsequently the enzymes that break down the carbohydrates are deactivated in the stomach. So once food enters the stomach, the stomach senses that the food is here and it starts releasing gastrin from those endoenteric cells and subsequently the parietal cells are going to release hydrochloric acid and the chief cells are going to release what? They're going to release pepsin because the pepsinogen is being converted into pepsin by the hydrochloric acid. And now we have that stomach churning. So gastrin is released by those endoenteric cells. The stomach starts churning and churning and churning, and eventually that hamburger becomes chyme, which is a watery substance. And now we start building up this chyme right here. And so this pyloric canal starts expanding, and it doesn't like it. And so the gastrin is going to squeeze the stomach, and the stomach is going to squeeze the chyme into the duodenum. And we call this the entero, entero gastric reflex. That's when we use gastrin to squeeze the chyme into the duodenum past the pyloric sphincter. Now you have this chyme in, in the duodenum right here, but the duodenum has its own mucosal lining, and the mucosal lining is filled with cells that secrete enzymes, and they activate the pancreas, and those activate the gallbladder to squeeze, and there's a whole process, and so we gotta really zoom in on this duodenum and see what it controls, because this guy right here, he means business. He has a lot to do with the digestive process. Now we will investigate the connection between the duodenum, the pancreas, and the bile duct. Here, all around here, all around here, are these little cells of the duodenum that secrete hormones. For instance, one of the cells is called a G cell, and this guy is inside the duodenum. And the G cell is going to increase gastrin. So when the food first enters the duodenum right there, the duodenum is going to release gastrin from the G cell. And all that does is that it's gonna increase the stomach activity. So it's, it's gonna shoot out more chyme into the duodenum. That's all the gastrin is doing. So the gastrin increases more chyme. It also increases the force at which the stomach squeezes the chyme into the duodenum. That's all gastrin does. Of course, this is called enteric and enteric gastrin and the production of gastrin only lasts for maybe half a second because we don't want too much chyme going into the duodenum if we have too much chyme right here this has a lot of solute it has a lot of vitamins and and proteins and carbs and therefore the water inside the tissues is going to go into the chyme and it's going to lead to dehydration so we got to limit how much chyme goes into the duodenum at a single moment so the production of enteric gastrin from the g cells located inside the duodenum is limited and it is very regulated we also have something called an s cell so this is an s cell and what this does is that it is going to create something called secretin secretin and what secretin does is that it is going to release the pancreatic juices. So it tells the pancreas that, hey, we are digesting something. I need you to kind of drip some pancreatic juices into the duodenum. And so here we have a little bit of pancreatic juices being released from the sphincter of Odie. And this guy right here is called what? The hepatopancreatic ampulla. Secretin doesn't really release that much pancreatic juice, but the next cell does release a lot of pancreatic juice. This guy right here just tells the pancreas to kind of warm up before we really use the pancreas. And also, when you open up the hepatopancreatic duct, you're also releasing bile into the duodenum. So the secretin releases pancreatic juices and also bile. The next cell that we use is something called the eye cell and the eye cell is going to make something called coli coli cysto cysto kinin so kinin right there and sometimes people abbreviate this to cck so coli cysto kinin is when the pancreas and the gallbladder are going to contract so this guy right here is going to increase the amount of pancreatic juices and also is going to increase the amount of bile. 
So secretin was just kind of dripping the pancreatic juices, but this guy right here is going to flood the duodenum with pancreatic juices and bile. Why do we need that pancreatic juice? Well, normally the gastric uh, chyme is going to have a low pH. It's very acidic. And this pancreatic juice has a higher pH. And this guy right here is going to neutralize the chyme, is going to bring up the pH of the chyme so we're not as irritating to the duodenum. We don't want to burn the duodenum. And so we use the pancreatic juices to increase the pH. Not only that, but the pancreatic juices have enzymes inside. And these enzymes help to digest the carbohydrates, the proteins, and it helps to absorb those nutrients in the intestines. And we will be using the bile to digest the lipids so that it, it kind of breaks the lipids into smaller pieces and it makes the lipids easily digestible by the body. We also have something called K cells. And what K cells do is that they are going to create something called glucose dependent insulinotropic peptides. So we make insulinotropic peptides. So tropic just means to have an effect. Peptides is just what it is. So this peptide has an effect on what? On insulin. So when we have this food in the duodenum, the duodenum releases the insulinotropic peptides and that's going to trigger the body to activate insulin. So the pancreas is going to release insulin from the beta cells. Now we have insulin going here. And insulin is going to grab those carbohydrates, the glucose from the food, and is going to shove the glucose into the body, is going to uh, allow that glucose to enter the cells and to be used as energy. If we did not have K cells, we would not be able to have the glucose inside the cells. And so all the glucose right here would just be in the duodenum and it would be excreted by the body. And we don't want that because the main energy source for the body is glucose. So these K cells are insulinotropic peptides, which increases the pancreatic's, uh, the, well, the pancreas's release of insulin. And finally, we have something called M cells. And M cells, that just increases the motilin. Motilin. And can you guess what motilin does? Motilin will increase the motility of the digestive system. So it will increase gastric emptying. It will increase the amount of chyme, or not really the amount, but the rate at which chyme leaves the pyloric sphincter. It will increase the motility of the duodenum. So we have all this food, we gotta move it. So we're gonna be contracting and relaxing the duodenum via peristalsis. And peristalsis is the smooth muscle moving this chyme down the small intestine. So motilin is going to increase the rate of peristalsis. And finally, M cells are also going to increase the production of, let's redo this, whoa, it's going to increase the production of pepsin. So we have pepsin being produced right there. And the reason why we want to produce pepsin is because we want those peptides to be digested inside the digestive system. Yep. So here we have pepsin. Motelin is going to increase the production of pepsin. So we have the increased production of pepsin. And the reason why we, we want to increase the production of pepsin is because we want to digest those proteins inside the small intestine. So the duodenum, as you can see, is really involved in the digestion of the food or the chyme. It's actually setting up everything for the uh, jejunum. So that is the next section of the digestive system. And we just covered the duodenum, but we didn't even talk about the enzymes inside the pancreas. So the pancreatic juices are going to have something, and they are called enzymes. So specifically, we have pancreatic amylase. We have pancreatic lipase. And we also have enzymes that break down proteins, and we got a lot of those enzymes. So these enzymes 
belong to a family called proteases. And we'll talk about them later. But proteases have to be activated by what? They have to be activated by something called enteropeptidiases. So enteropeptidiases. And these guys are made from the brush border inside the small intestine with the microvilli. But we'll talk about this later. Right now, we got to talk about amylase and lipase. Amylase and lipase are going to be inside the pancreatic juices. And these guys, they come out swinging. These guys are active because they don't harm the pancreas. The reason why we have to activate the proteases inside the small intestine and not the pancreas is because if these enzymes are activated in the pancreas, they will start digesting the pancreas. These proteases have to be activated somewhere else because if these proteases are active in the pancreas, they start to degrade the pancreas. And that leads to pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. And that is the inflammation and the breakdown of the pancreas by those enzymes. Not the amylase or not the lipase, but rather the proteases. So again, these proteases have to be activated by the enteropeptidiase that is secreted by the brush border um, enzymes, which is found in the microvilli, in the small intestines. So for instance, the jejunum or the ileum. And now I'm going to show you a little secret. They don't tell you this in anatomy books. You have to pick it up in medicine. So here we actually ran some tests. So for instance, we checked a person's amylase and we checked a person's lipase levels. And we saw that it is actually elevated. So here was the prior results. And then over time, the level decreased to this. So normally, the enzymes will decrease over time. However, why did we check for these enzymes? Well, the patient came in and they said, hey, I had some really, really bad stomach pain. I was at home, I was drinking wine, and I just start feeling this, this terrible pain in my, in my stomach. And they pointed at their stomach, uh, the upper portion of it. They're pointing at their pancreas. And when you have a patient that says, I was just minding my own business, relaxing at home, and I had this severe stomach pain out of nowhere, that should give you a clue, hey, maybe we're dealing with pancreatitis. You should especially be worried if they say, I have severe stomach pain every time I drink alcohol. So alcohol is going to cause a flare-up. So you could never drink alcohol again when you have pancreatitis. However, let's say that a person never drinks alcohol. They come to you and they say, you know, sometimes I'm just minding my own business and I have severe stomach pain. I don't know what's going on. Well, you should be thinking, hey, maybe we should check for pancreatitis. The way you check for it is that you check for amylase and lipase. Pancreatitis is due to the overproduction of proteases. And these proteases are active for whatever reason inside the pancreas. However, there are so many different types of peptides or sorry, protein enzymes being produced that we don't know which one to check for. However, an increase in proteases always means that we have an increase in the other enzymes. So we have an increase in amylase or we can have an increase in lipase. In this case, the patient had an increase in both amylase and lipase. So the physician was able to say, hey, we're dealing with something called pancreatitis. And I'm also worried about any obstructions inside the bile duct. So we have to do an ultrasound of the gallbladder and we have to do uh, more exams. So we have to do something called a HIDA scan. And a HIDA scan is just an ultrasound of the gallbladder. And they check if the gallbladder is swollen or if there's any blockages right here. And luckily for this patient, there was uh, not too much of a blockage. So you can have a blockage here inside the, the gallbladder and that could cause a, an infection or it can cause pancreatitis. Here we have the proteases. So these are the inactive forms, the purple are inactive, and we have to use the enteropeptidiases. We have to use the enteropeptidiases. 
created by the brush border enzymes and the microvilli, we have to convert them into the active forms. So the chymotrypsinogen will convert into chymotrypsin, trypsinogen will convert into trypsin, and procarboxypeptidiase will become carboxypeptidiase. So now these guys can actually digest the proteins inside the chyme, and this is only occurring inside the small intestines, not inside the pancreas. But what do these enzymes do anyways? Well, chymotrypsinogen is going to affect the amino acids, and specifically the amino acids that are aromatic, aromatic. And so these guys right here are going to have the little rings right there. So these amino acids have these rings, and this is an aromatic ring. What kind of amino acids have this? Well, we have tryptophan, tryptophan. We also have tyrosine, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. So we have phenyl, phenyl, alanine. Before I leave this picture, I have to talk about nucleases. So inside the pancreatic juices, we have nucleases. And this helps to digest the DNA and the RNA of the food. So whenever you eat a steak, the steak has cells inside of it, and each cell has a nucleus, and this nucleus has DNA. And there's also a little bit of RNA inside the food. And so these guys right here, this is going to help us digest DNA. And this guy right here helps us digest RNA. And eventually we're going to break these guys down to get those pentose phosphate groups. And we can use the building blocks for DNA and RNA into our bodies. So we can steal some DNA and RNA and we can break it down and use those building blocks to create more cells in our bodies. And that's kind of creepy if you think about it. And those building blocks can be further broken down by nucleosidase and phosphatase. And these enzymes are created by the brush border enzymes. And eventually what we get are nitrogenous bases, phosphates, and also pentose. And these guys right here can be reabsorbed by the body and used to create more cells. However, trypsin, trypsin right here, is going to degrade leucine and arginine. So arginine is going to be degraded by trypsin and leucine is going to be degraded by trypsin. Carboxypeptidiase, well, since we're talking about amino acids, all amino acids have a carboxyl group. And this carboxyl group is going to be degraded by the carboxypeptidiase. So we're going to be reusing these amino acids from the chyme into the body. So all amino acids have carboxy groups, and so carboxypeptidiase is going to degrade it. Trypsin will degrade leucine and arginine, while the tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanines, the aromatics, are going to be targeted by chymotrypsin. Here we have this chyme, and this chyme is filled with a bunch of enzymes. And the chyme goes into the jejunum right here. And from here on out, the jejunum is releasing enzymes as well. How are we releasing these enzymes? Well, here we have the villi, and these villi have small villi. And these guys right here are the microvilli. And these microvilli are going to accumulate right here in the intestines. So as the chyme goes down the intestines, they are interacting with the microvilli. And this microvilli has the brush border enzymes. And it also has absorptive cells called enterocytes. Enterocytes. So these enterocytes are going to release something called what? Enteropeptidiases. And again, enteropeptidiases, they're going to convert chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin. We're going to convert trypsinogen into trypsin, and we're going to convert procarboxypeptidiase into carboxypeptidiase, and that allows the body to start absorbing those proteins. And that is, of course, related to the enterocytes. This guy right here is found on the brush border within the microvilli. 
and all throughout the small intestine, we have these cells that are secreting mucus for the lubrication of the food, but we also have something called, well, has something called a panath, panath cell. And what these guys do is that they produce lysozyme, lysozyme. And lysozyme is going to kill bacteria, so they kill bad bacteria. And that helps keep the small intestine sanitary. Within the small intestine, we have different cells that produce different enzymes. So for instance, we have cells that produce alpha dextrinase. And all you gotta know about alpha dextrinase is that it's going to break down the carbohydrate into glucose, which is the main energy source for the body. We also have different enzymes called maltase, sucrase, and lactase. All they do is produce what? They produce glucose. And if you wanna be super smart, sucrose will also produce fructose, and lactose will be called galactose. But all you gotta know is that we produce alpha dextrinase, maltase, sucrase, and lactase. And they break down the carbohydrates into glucose. And that glucose will be uh, absorbed into the um, blood vessels and be sent to the liver for further processing. So we wanna make sure that the nutrients are not toxic. So we will uh, get those proteins, we will get those carbohydrates, we will get those lipids, and we're gonna send it into the liver. So far, we've only been talking about carbohydrates and proteins, and these components are being broken down by the enzymes from the pancreatic juices and also the brush border of the microvilli. These components, let's draw them over here, these are proteins and carbohydrates, they can easily go into the capillary and be taken into the liver to be filtered and processed. However, lipids are a lot more difficult to process why? Well, here we have the chyme, and the chyme has a lot of water. And as you know, lipids do not like water, so they will kind of stay solid. They're not going to be really digested by the body. And so we got to find a way to make these lipids easily digestible. And that's where we use bile. We will use bile. And bile is going to surround the lipids and is going to make them into small droplets. And this is called emulsification. Right here, we have the bile surrounding the lipid. The bile has two portions. We have the green portion, which is the hydrophilic side, and we have the yellow portion, which is the hydrophobic side. The hydrophilic side is going to be facing the water portion of the chyme, while the hydrophobic side is going to be facing the lipid portion. And what this does is that we form something called a mysole. And this mysole is going to separate the lipids into smaller droplets. And now this is called emulsification. So here we have the mysoles, and the mysoles are going to enter the, the uh, villi. So we have these little circles right there. And these guys are going to make its way into the lacteals. But before we do that, the mysoles have to go into the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus will process the lipids. So we have the fatty, the fatty globules are going to be processed into the Golgi apparatus. A chylomicron, that's just a fancy way to say that the lipid has proteins on it. So specifically, we're gonna have these glycoproteins, glycoproteins that surround the lipid. And that's what we have here. So again, the fatty globules combine with proteins to form chylomicrons, and that occurs inside the Golgi apparatus. So the Golgi apparatus processes the lipids and they form little bubbles. This guy right here is a chylo, chylomicron. And this bubble eventually is going to go inside the cell and is going to release the lipids into the lacteals. And again, the lacteal is a little tube for the lipids, and it uses bile as a transport system. So this lipid is going to go into the lacteal and enter the lymphatic system. And this lymphatic system is going to go and is going to follow the blood vessels. So these guys right here are on their way into the liver.
So that's how lipid is being absorbed by the small intestine. So lipids need a little bit more attention, a little bit more finesse to digest. Before I move on, I have to mention that bile has something called bile salts. And bile salts allow us to emulsify those lipids. And eventually we have to recycle those bile salts because if we don't recycle the bile salts, they will be passed inside the stool. And that stool is going to be released from the body. And these bile salts are very important. They're typically made from uh, triglycerides. So we're gonna have triglycerides and also phospholipids. So that allows us again to emulsify those fats. And what happens here is that the bile salts are going to leave the ileum. They cross into the capillary bed from the villi and they're, they're just gonna use the hepatic portal vein. So that's just a fancy uh, highway of uh, vessels that make their way into the liver. So the hepatic portal vein is all over the small intestine. All the nutrients go into the hepatic portal vein, for instance, carbs and also proteins. But you know what doesn't enter the hepatic portal vein? Lipids. Lipids do not enter the hepatic portal vein. Instead, lipids use the lacteal. And the lacteal is a part of the lymphatic, lymphatic system. So this guy right here, this lymphatic system, yeah, he's going to enter the liver, but they do not use the hepatic portal vein. Instead, carbohydrates and proteins use the hepatic portal vein but not the lipids, and that's always on exams. And so here you see the bile salts being pushed into the capillary bed of the hepatic portal vein. They're gonna be recycled into the liver. We do not want to lose these bile salts because they are very critical for the digestion of lipids. Here is the liver, and the liver is the body's way of filtering nutrients. So we gotta make sure that the nutrients that we're absorbing don't have any bacteria and they don't have any toxins. We don't want that in the body. When we are absorbing the nutrients from the chyme, we are absorbing the carbohydrates, we are absorbing the proteins, and those carbohydrates and proteins, so these carbs and proteins, they are going to enter the liver via the portal venule. The portal venule. So the venule, which is a very, very small vein, has a lot of nutrients. The arterial, on the other hand, the arterial doesn't have a lot of nutrients. Instead, the arterial has a lot of oxygen. And the arterial just serves to give oxygen to the liver because again, the liver is made of tissue and those tissues are made of cells and those cells need oxygen to survive. The venule is made uh, well, it's not made from, it has a high concentration of nutrients. The reason why it is partially deoxygenated is because in the small intestines, when the arterioles were giving out oxygen to the small intestines, they lost their oxygen and then they picked up nutrients. So those capillaries gave oxygen and as those capillaries traveled further along the small intestines, they picked up nutrients from the small intestines. And then they entered the hepatic portal system and now they are giving those nutrients to the liver to be what? To be filtered. On the other hand, lipids right here, they don't use the hepatic portal system. Instead, lipids use the lacteals and the lacteals are part of the lymphatic, lymphatic system. And the lacteals are going to join into the liver via the bile duct. So in this bile duct, it's a lot of bile, and this bile is carrying lipids. And eventually, they enter the liver. And what we're looking at is called a lobule. So this is a hepatic, hepatic lobule. And it kind of looks like what? It looks like a pentagon. That's what it looks like. One, two, three, four, five, six, actually a hexagon, so I don't know basic geometry, but that's what it looks like. So we zoom in on this lobule, and now we can actually look at the foundation of filtration in the liver. On each side of the hepatic lobule, we have something called 
the triad, and the triad is just made from the portal venules, the arterioles, and the bile ducts. So this right here is called a triad, because there are three of them. There are three vessels. The venule has a lot of nutrients, but not too much oxygen. The arterial doesn't have that many nutrients, but it has a lot of oxygen. And the bile duct has bile, and is going to be transporting this lipid into the hepatocytes. It's going to be traveling this lipid into the liver. Attached to the venules, as you see here, this vein looking thing, are sinusoids. Our sinusoids. So let's do that in a different color. Our sinusoids. So let's say that we have the carbs and the protein and we're being transported via the hepatic portal vein. So we enter the portal venule and we got to filter this uh, nutrient because if we have toxins or bacteria we don't want those toxins and bacteria to go inside the body or into the systemic circulation. So now we enter these tunnels and these tunnels are called sinusoids. And these sinusoids have little windows in them. They have little holes. And those are called fenestrations. Now, as the venules release their nutrients into the sinusoids, some of the nutrients go into the hepatocytes. These guys right here are the hepatocytes, the liver cells. And the hepatocytes are the main people that filter the blood. So as the blood releases the nutrients into the hepatocytes, the hepatocytes begin filtering. And specifically, the hepatocytes have something special, hepatocytes. They have the Golgi, they have the lysosomes, lysosomes, and they also have peroxisomes. And the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum. But what do these organelles do in the hepatocytes? Well, as the nutrients flow into the hepatocytes, they have to be filtered. And so the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, that's going to get rid of the toxins. So for instance, if I take aspirin, aspirin is going to enter the hepatocytes and is going to be destroyed, is going to be processed by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So we can say that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to be what? Is going to, is going to do, destroy toxins and also medication. But now you have these byproducts, you have these leftovers of the toxins, you have the leftovers of the medication, you have the leftovers of the aspirin in this example. So these guys right here, they're going to be packaged by the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus makes bile and it will get those toxins and put them in a bubble. So now we have these toxins filled in to a bubble and this bubble is going to be carried by bile. Bile is going to go back into the duodenum and it's going to go into the small intestine and from the small intestine it's going to go to the large intestine, it's going to go into the stool and be excreted by the body. So eventually this is going to be excreted by the stool. But what do peroxisomes do? Well, peroxisomes are going to degrade alcohol. So let's say that I had four shots of vodka. So this alcohol right here is going to enter the liver and is going to be processed by peroxisome. So we're just going to call this PS. Peroxisome is going to break down alcohol using uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. And that is going to make acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde. And of course, I cannot spell aldehyde. And this is a byproduct. So what do we do with byproducts? We will send them to the Golgi apparatus, and they're going to be put into that bubble. And that bubble is going to leave the body with the stool as, um, as stool. <laughs> so peroxisomes are going to degrade alcohol. So they degrade toxins as well. What do lysosomes do? Lysosomes, we're going to call this LS, lysosomes store iron. 
So iron is going to be stored inside the body via the lysosomes, and those lysosomes are in the hepatocytes. So you can say that the liver helps to store iron for the body. So if we ever need to make more hemoglobin, we can use the iron stores inside the liver. And again, the lysosomes, they store iron. As the blood enters the venules and they enter the sinusoids, we have to clean up this uh, blood. So this blood has nutrients, but we have to clean it up. We have janitors that do this, and these janitors are called Kupfer, Kupfer cells, also known as stellate, stellate cells. And Kupfer cells are macrophages. So why do we need them? Well, let's say that we have some old red blood cells. Red blood cells have to be removed and recycled every 120 days. As the red blood cell ages, it does not carry as much oxygen as it should, and therefore has to be removed from the body. Kupfer cells will remove old red blood cells. Also, let's say that we have some bacteria. So for whatever reason, we have some bacteria traveling with the blood that's filled with nutrients. We don't want this bacteria to go into the systemic circulation. And so the Kupfer cells will remove some of the bad bacteria here we have a bad guy. The Kupfer cell is going to remove it, and now we have no bacteria. So the macrophages are going to eat. They're going to nibble on the bad bacteria. So these Kupfer cells are the janitors, and they're also the bodyguards for the liver. So that's the way that the liver removes uh, any bad pathogens. Toxins from medications and toxins from alcohol are going to be processed by the hepatocytes. Between the hepatocytes and the sinusoid, there is no basement membrane. The hepatocytes are almost touching the sinusoid. However, there is a little space uh, that's special. So here we have the hepatocyte, here we have the sinusoid, and between the space is something very special. Between the space is the space of DESI. DESI right here, so we have SSE, and this space of DESI has the Kupfer cells, Kupfer cells right there, but it also has a large concentration of another type of cell, and these guys, we're going to call them ETO, ETO cells, and ETO cells are called hepatic, hepatic stellate cells. So Kupfer cells are just called stellate cells, and Edo cells are called hepatic stellate cells. Here we have a zoomed up image of the space of Desi, and here is the sinusoid. So again, we have a lot of the nutrients be carried by the hepatic venule, and a lot of these nutrients will eventually go into the hepatocyte to be filtered. And from then on, this hepatocyte is going to return the nutrients and these nutrients are going to go and flow into the central vein. And we'll talk about the central vein later. But as this happens, we have the Cooper cells monitoring the bacteria. They don't want any bacteria entering the hepatocyte. When we ingest alcohol, alcohol is a toxin and it's going to go into the hepatocyte and be uh, processed by the peroxisome. Aspirin or medications will be processed inside the hepatocyte and they're going to be processed by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The byproducts of that process is going to be pushed into the Golgi apparatus and that Golgi apparatus is going to put it into the bile and that bile is going to be excreted from the body via the stool. But when we look at the space of Desi, we have a large concentration of ETO, ETO cells. And what these guys do is that the ETO cells are going to carry vitamin A. So this is kind of like a storage site for vitamin A. And we use vitamin A as retinol, retinol, and that helps the eyes to see. So that's a vitamin that the eyes use to produce images. So vitamin A is going to be carried by the ETO cells. When we have trauma, let's say that we donated 30% of our liver, the ETO cells are going to do 
they're going to convert into myofibroblasts. And these guys are going to regenerate the liver. So they're going to make collagen and liver tissue. So the liver is one of the few organs that can actually regenerate itself. However, if you lose too much of your liver, let's say that you lose 80% of your liver, it will not regenerate to the full capacity. If we donate 20% of our liver to somebody else, we can regenerate that 20% easily. It just takes a couple of weeks to do that. And that is thanks to the Edo cells. So the Edo cells are going to convert into myofibroblasts in case we have any trauma for the liver. Also, I should mention that the lipids are also entering the sinusoid. The bile ducts carry the lipids via the bile. So the lipids are also being processed by the hepatocytes and they come from the bile duct. So after the hepatocytes have finished processing the proteins the carbohydrates and the lipids, they give the nutrients back. So here we have the nutrients going back from the hepatocytes into the sinusoid. And the sinusoid is going to carry this filtered, this very clean uh, nutrient into the central vein. And the central vein, also known as the hepatic vein or the interloper vein, is eventually going to go and enter the hepatic, or sorry, the the inferior inferior vena cava. So that's where all the deoxygenated blood goes and it enters the heart. And from there, it's going to leave the heart and enter the pulmonary circuit. And then it will return to the heart as oxygenated blood. And eventually that oxygenated blood has a lot of nutrients. And those nutrients are going to go into the systemic circulation. So the muscle cells and the arms and the legs and the stomach, that is going to receive nutrients. And that's pretty much it. And that's how the body processes nutrients. That's how it digests food. That's how it sends the nutrients into the systemic circulation. And that's also the filtration process. But now that we finished digesting and we finished filtering out nutrients, we have to finish digestion. We have to stop digestion. So how do we stop digestion from the intestinal phase? Well, the body starts to release something called somatostatin. And somatostatin will decrease motility in the stomach, motility, and it will decrease hydrochloric production. It will decrease enzyme activity. And it's going to decrease digestion. So that's when the body says, hey, we have enough nutrients. I'm no longer hungry. Let's stop digestion. And therefore, we secrete somatostatin. Before we go, I want to kind of give some clinical knowledge to what we learned. And the gallbladder is very finicky. It's very sensitive in the GI system. And you can have a lot of problems from the gallbladder. For instance, we can have the formation of the formation of gallstones. So the formation of gallstones occurs when the bile just kind of sits there, or there's a high concentration of solutes inside the bile. So these gallstones start to build up in the gallbladder, and you can have a blockage in the gallbladder. So now this gallbladder is going to swell up and it's going to be irritated and that causes abdominal pain. And therefore, we gotta figure out a way to diagnose this. How do you find gallstones? Well, if you have a person that presents with abdominal pain and they keep pointing uh, near their pancreas, you can do something like an ultrasound. So you can do an abdominal ultrasound. Ultrasound. And here's what a ultrasound of the gallbladder looks like when there are gallstones. Here we have an ultrasound of the gallbladder and you will notice there are some bumps right there. So there are some bumps here and that is actually the gallstone, the gallbladder stones. And you can really see them really nicely using the ultrasound technique. What if we want to do something that is more sensitive than an ultrasound? Well, in that case, you would order something called a HIDA scan. You would order something called a HIDA scan. And what this stands for is hepatobiliary immunodiacetic 
acid scan. It's a very long name, but if you just say HIDA scan, people will understand what you're saying. And what a HIDA scan does is that people inject a fluid into the body, and that fluid is slightly radioactive, just a little bit. It's not enough to harm the body, but it shows up in the liver and it will start to glow. And the way we use it is that we can see if the gallbladder is open or if there is some, some blockages inside the gallbladder. So on the right, we have a normal HIDA scan. So here we have this little black dot right there. We're gonna cover it in green. That is the gallbladder. So there is nothing wrong with the gallbladder here because the tracer, the injection, is found inside the gallbladder. And you will see that over time, we have this formation. This is the what? This is the biliary duct right here. The biliary duct has bile and the bile has the tracer. So over time, we can see that the biliary duct is forming. So the tracer is being concentrated inside the biliary duct. So there's nothing wrong here. And right here, would be the pancreas, but you don't see the pancreas because the bile is not found inside the pancreas. But you can see that over here we have the gallbladder, which is normal. On the left, you will notice something that is abnormal. Where is the gallbladder? If the gallbladder was open, you would see the tracer right here, but you don't see it. Instead, you see the tracer inside the bile duct. So here we have a nice picture of the bile duct but we are missing the gallbladder. The gallbladder should be right here, but you don't see it. You don't see any glow right in that area. Instead, you see a glow inside the biliary duct. So that tells us that there is an obstruction right there. So when we see an obstruction in the HIDA scan, usually that means that we have to do surgery. We have to do a colonectomy, a uh, cholestidectomy. So it's very hard for me to pronounce, but essentially they're going to remove the gallbladder from the body since it is completely blocked. And if it's blocked, you have a buildup of bile and that causes irritation, it causes abdominal, abdominal pain, and it could lead to the gallbladder bursting. And you don't want that happening. The same thing is true with gallbladder stones. If you have too many gallbladder stones, the physician may have to surgically remove your gallbladder and that is a cholecystectomy. However, I'm gonna give you a really good tip. Whenever you see no gallbladder right there from the HIDA scan, you may be saying, oh, we gotta scrub up, we gotta do surgery right now. Wait a minute, okay? Because there is a, a very rare uh, congenital deformity in people. And this is called, this is called gall, gallbladder A, Genesis. And this means we have no formation of the gallbladder. So yeah, sometimes we don't have the gallbladder bladder showing up in the HIDA scan. However, sometimes there was no gallbladder to begin with. We're not clogged up. We just never had a gallbladder. So that is very rare. Only about 65 people out of 100,000 people have gallbladder agenesis that is a non-formation of the gallbladder. So I don't want you to scrub up, I don't want you to waste your time putting on scrubs or getting ready for surgery if there is no gallbladder to work on. So the question is, how do we prevent wasting time? How do we prevent putting the patient under anesthesia and putting them under the knife only to find that there's no gallbladder? Because sometimes you may be looking for a surgical incision like a history of cholecystectomy, but there is no incision. How do we prevent wasting time and money? We can use something called magnetic resonance choleoangiopancreatography. And yes, you do sound smart when you say it, but what is it? This is the magnetic resonance choleoangiopancreatography, also known as the MRCP and it is absolutely fantastic. I mean, look at the structure that you're seeing. This is the gallbladder right there. This is the common biliary duct. This is the hepatic biliary duct. These are the biliary branches. With this uh, 
with this test, you can see any obstruction. I mean, if we have an obstruction right here, we can see it because it won't glow up. If we have an obstruction here, we can see it because it won't glow up. And so this magnetic resonance cholioangiopancreatography is amazing. And it's used by the MRI. So it is a MRI specific to the gallbladder. And the way they do it is that they inject something called gadolinium. So we have gado Linium. So they inject gadolinium inside the patient, and the gadolinium will go into the bile and glow in the MRI. So you do this after, after the HIDA scan. And that's just to double, sh uh, to, to make sure that for sure we don't have a gallbladder, or we do have a gallbladder. You know, so you want to do this after the HIDA scan because the HIDA scan revealed that there is no gallbladder. Well, you have to make sure that there is a gallbladder and that is obstructive. If you have the MRCP and there is no gallbladder, what does it look like? It looks like this. So notice that the magnetic resonance cholioangiopancreatography was injected into the patient, but there is no gallbladder and there is no history of the gallbladder ever being removed. And so luckily we did the MRCP before we did surgery because it's very bad if you cut into the patient and you realize that there is no gallbladder. You just wasted the patient's time and you subjected them to surgical trauma when they shouldn't have been subjected to that surgical trauma. So instead of doing surgery, first you want to do the magnetic resonance cholioangiopancreatography, also known as the MRCP, the MRCP. And if you see something like this, where there is no gallbladder, stop. We have something else. We, we, there is no gallbladder. There is no obstruction because there is no gallbladder. So for some reason, this patient is having abdominal pain and there's probably an obstruction inside the, the biliary tree. Or maybe there's an obstruction here in the common bile duct. But for sure, there is no gallbladder. And that's when we would use the magnetic resonance cholioangiopancreatography. However, if you can't do the MRCP, not the MCRC, <laughs> MRCP, that's embarrassing. If you can't do that, we have something called the endo, endoscopic uh, retrograde cholioangiopancreatography. So we're just going to call that CP. And what this does, it, it basically gives us the same picture, and we do this before surgery. However, this is really invasive because you have to put the person under anesthesia, you have to inject uh, a tracer into that patient, and you also have to have like a crew of people. You have to have like more than four people helping you out, and you go inside their throat with a camera, and you kind of look inside their throat and their upper GI system and is very invasive. It, you can actually puncture uh, one of the organs. You can cause an infection. It is not that good. So if you can't do the MRCP, you can do the endoscopic retrograde cholioangiopancreatography, but it's not preferred. But you always want to attempt to do it MRCP before you do surgery. And that saves time and it prevents any injuries for the patient. And that is the end of the gastrointestinal foundation. So hopefully now you understand how the food is being digested, how the nutrients are absorbed, how the liver filters toxins, when to order an MRCP, how to look for an ultrasound, all that great stuff. So thank you so much for studying with me and for spending time with me. Remember that I love you and that you are awesome. So thank you so much and I love you. Bye.